<laughs> Greetings of peace, everyone. It is my great pleasure uh, to be here with you all today. Uh, also, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, of course, depending from which part of the world are you joining us today or watching this recording. This is the third webinar in a series of webinars that we organize uh, this month. So we are concluding with this one today. And the topic of today's webinar is freedom of expression, freedom of religion or belief and hate speech. And we will try to answer to the question or to provide some inputs of how to reconcile them. Uh, before that, I just want to mention that I'm, I'm Leila Hassan Dujapo, I'm Kaisi, the fellow, uh, and together with my colleague Amina Frilak, who will be moderating this discussion, we are two Kaisi fellows for this year, and as a part of our program or project uh, as a Kaisi fellowship program, we decide to conduct this series of webinar, and before webinar, we also conducted in-person workshop in Sarajevo for young people in order to help them detect and react and respond on the hate speech and to recognize the hate speech and react on that. Before this, this webinar, as I said, it is the third and the last one in the series. We have two other webinars. First one was on the topic of the youth people and the youth um, um, organization or project on combating hate speech. And we were discussing about challenges, but also some opportunities and good practices. Uh, last week, we had a webinar on the topic how we can use interfaith dialogue as a tool or, or alternative to the hate speech, and today we come to the topic of freedom of expression. As I said, this webinar is co-organized as a part of the Kaisit Fellowship Program together with Youth for Peace and United Religion Initiative. So just shortly to mention a few words about each of these partners, Kaisit is an international dialogue center, and the Kaisit Fellowship Program brings together leaders and educators from different religious backgrounds from all over the world for training in dialogue, facilitation, intercultural communication, and also for promoting social cohesion by different, and this is provided by different KISIT experts. And the program equips fellows like us and some of other colleagues who are today panelists uh, with the skills to educate their students and communities about interreligious dialogue so that they can become facilitators and leaders in the dialogue and also active peace advocates in their communities. As I mentioned, this is co-organized together with Youth for Peace, which is a young-led organization from Bosnia and Herzegovina. And Youth for Peace is formed as young people of diverse religions and spiritual expression coming from different cultures and traditions backgrounds from Bosnia and Herzegovina. They decide to establish Youth for Peace in order to promote dialogue, interfaith, and interethnic cooperation, and also in order to end any kind of violence and to create cultures of peace, justice for youth. And last but not least is United the Religion Initiative, which is a global grassroots interfaith network that cultivates peace and justice by engaging people to bridge religious and cultural differences and also to work together for the good of their communities and the world. And the branch of URI Europe is co-organizing this event. So it was my great pleasure just to open this discussion and to welcome you all. And now I will give floor to my dear colleague Amina, who will moderate the rest of the discussion and introduce the panelists. So Amina, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Leila. Thank you for this uh, beautiful introduction and for introducing the organizers and the partners. Today with us, we have four amazing panelists, people who are working in the field and who are going to share their expertise and who are going to share with us what they do and share something about the topic that we have today. Um, as our first panelist, uh, we have Heidi Rautjanma, who's coming from Finland. She's an adult educator, a teacher, a journalist, and a Lutheran pastor. She also gives trainings on interfaith issues, mainly for teachers and people from different religious communities and young people. She has more than 20 years of experience in organizing various interfaith activities on the grassroots level in Finland, but also internationally. She's a Kaisid Fellow and a board member of the ENORB, which is European Network on Religion and Belief, but also a committee member of Religions for Peace European Women of Faith Network. She also served um, several years as an ambassador of the parliaments of the world's religions and as a global council trustee of the United Religions Initiative. Also, she co-founded and coordinated four interfaith URI CCs in Finland since 2000. One of these CCs is multi-regional NGO called Uskot Ilmar Rayo Yaru, which means Faiths Without Borders. And she also edited three books related to interfaith and intercultural dialogue and cooperation. At the moment, she's working in a project called Kukaki 
to the cultural value and language awareness in basic education. Besides that, uh, she trains teachers on how to take awareness of languages, cultures, and worldviews into account at school, but she also writes her PhD thesis on pedagogy of inter-worldview education, but also studies to become a health education teacher and a vocational guidance counselor. So a woman with many hats, with many roles, and with many, uh, with many roles that she um, actually had uh, and still, still has. And Heidi, the Zoom is yours. We are looking forward to hearing from you and to hear from your inputs about these topics. Thank you very much for being with us uh, today. today. Thank you very much. It's my, my pleasure to be part of this uh, webinar. I want to congratulate uh, Leila and Emina for organizing such important uh, session. And I want to also add that I'm a mother of two daughters. The other daughter is uh, 14, no, 15 years old, and the other one is 25 years old. Okay, I will say a few words about the importance of interfaith education for a more sustained, peaceful, and just world to answer the title of this webinar. And I will use a lot of pictures in this presentation because as we know, one photo tells more than a thousand words. So I don't have to speak that much. And, and also that I will not like to talk so much about theories. Just about an hour ago, I had a webinar. Uh, it was a part of the educational conference and it was so full of theories that I just want to go to the practice. Okay, now I try to switch the slide, but for some reason I have difficulties. Why is it so? Okay, yes. So first of all, uh, I will introduce just few interfaith activities from grassroots. I have personally been active in promoting interfaith dialogue and cooperation some 20 years. And uh, during these years of uh, our URI CCs and Religions for Peace Women of Faith Network in Finland have had a great role to play in educating the field about personal commitment and about action oriented interfaith dialogue and cooperation. And uh, because uh, being a, a woman, and uh, some, sometimes I have received this discrimination myself, I always want to highlight the importance of women. Um, in order to have a relevant interfaith activities to respond to the challenges we are facing today, such as hate speech that is mentioned in the title of this webinar, Women's work must be recognized and everyone's work anyways. Individuals can do a lot if they are supported and if they feel their work matter as well. Full participation is very important. Unfortunately, there are too often such power structures and discrimination that don't support everyone's participation. By the initiatives of two women in Helsinki, my friend Paula Kemel and I, there was an interfaith peace prayer event on the marketplace just a day after the terrorist acts in 2018, done in cooperation with several actors. We wanted to show people on the street that we are for peace and we wanted to build more trust between people and more secure feeling among people. We were on the market near the shopping mall and bus and metro stations for purpose and not inside the church or any other religious buildings so that we were seen. It was also important for freedom of belief to organize something visible on the street and also concrete matter to show the positivity that people of faith can bring. 
And by the initiative of the same people, there was a cleaning session and a peace ring being done after the vandalist graffiti act toward the mosque. That was really important for the community to receive solidarity and care for the neighborhood and to turn this hate action to love action. So to say, the result of this harmful action was that people got together and showed that there is more friendship than hate. And people have a right to practice their faith. If someone attacks to any religious places, it is like an attack to my own religious place as well. This was the message we wanted to tell. And there was another cleaning session as well that took place for the same reason, and also a bigger event with the title, Never Leave a Friend. People from different organizations, religious communities, politicians and artists and influencers came to give a talk. I brought people from different states to say a few words and also Sunni Muslim leaders to create in solidarity this Shia community. So those were a few examples of, of how our work on the grassroots has re responded hate speech and hate acts and how we have promoted the freedom of faith. But any kind of activity that promotes dialogue is an effort to abolish hate speech and create a more safe environment to promote respect when people are communicating with each other. Dialogue is a method and at the same time it is a goal to be achieved. I believe in experimental learning when training people to be in dialogue. People have possibility to ask questions directly from the authentic persons and get to know people from other faiths and cultural backgrounds. It is very important to have a forum to meet face to face and find out the commonalities, to have forum that is moderated by the person that takes care that participants feel safe at least safer. The best way to study religions and faiths is to attend the religious places and hear the personal experiences. Telling stories in re reflective way is one way of sharing those experiences that might open our heart to learn something new. Together, we would not have learned alone or not learned only from books or not just from teachers' presentations. Experimental learning invites to reflect and transformation needs this reflection. It is very essential that the facilitator knows how to be a bridge builder. People have so much stereotypes and prejudices that the visit can even strengthen the stereotypes if the host and the educator of the group are not prepared for the visit, if they are not aware of the pedagogy of the visits. I will talk now about the need for transformation education in facing challenges that polarization is one of them. Because transformation of our societies is crucial to overcome also other current challenges such as the pandemic and different crises of sustainability. Active individuals that are equipped with critical knowledge and skills are needed. Learners are challenged to understand the change, to manage uncertainty, to think critically, to make value changes, to appreciate of diversity, and to be empathic, just to name some. In that way, also the freedom of expression and freedom of speech and belief is able to take place naturally. It is a transformative pedagogy 
that we need to train and educate. And that is actually a lifelong learning. This asks cognitive learning, but also social and emotional learning that refers to having a sense of belonging to a com common humanity with shared values and responsibilities. That, for example, the Global Ethic Declaration points out an empathy, solidarity, and respect for differences and diversity, and having a sense of responsibility for the future. Social and emotional learning is very important in creating a safe learning environment. But the question goes, do teachers have time and competence and other resources to facilitate more safe space? No, they don't. There is so much pain in the classroom. The teaching profession is intellectually and emotionally challenging. Teachers need to have competence on trauma sensitive teaching. This means that relationships have to come before content. This is when my work comes. I train teachers on cultural worldview and language awareness in education and in general at school. The social and emotional work has to start with teachers. Educators who see the value of a practice in their own lives are more likely to be passionate advocates. And the learning ecosystem is only truly healthy when all members of the community are thriving. In other words, helping teachers feel emotionally grounded and supported is helping students too. So my work at this moment is to equip teachers with inter-worldview dialogue skills. According to the latest curriculum for basic education in Finland launched in 2014, the schools in Finland are expected to be aware of different languages and to see culture as a richness to promote participation and democracy, to promote equity and equality, and to take responsibility for the environment and to focus on sustainable future. Also to train students to be in dialogue among people from different worldviews is mentioned in the curriculum. The core curriculum describes seven transversal competence areas. These aims of education and reflect the competencies needed in all spheres of life. And I will mention a few of the competencies and you will hear that dialogue is somehow included. The transversal competencies are thinking and learning to learn, cultural competence, interaction and expression, taking care of oneself, managing daily life, multiliteracy, ICT competence, working life competence and entrepreneurship, participation, involvement, and building a sustainable future. And what is very special in a Finnish curriculum system now is that there are multidisciplinary learning modules mentioned in the curriculum in basic education as well. And they are the tools for integrating learning and for increasing the dialogue between different subjects. So the first time it is compulsory for the schools to organize one such module at least once every school year. So the core curriculum obligates the schools to plan and implement these in cooperation between different subjects and involving pupils in their planning. So people really learn to be in dialogue also in the classroom and this is now what the teachers are learning to educate students together. And uh, that's why we have this project at the university at the moment called Cultural Worldview and Language Awareness in Basic Education. And this is what we try to do, that we educate teachers to work together. I think that's it. You can uh, make comments and ask questions if you want to know more about this project or the work we have been doing in, in Finland around this matter. 
Thank you very much, Heidi. I truly enjoyed in your um, presentation and in what you said to us. I really like that you emphasize the importance of education because everything starts with education. And I think we are pretty much aware of it, but it's just a question, how do we organize it and how do we actually instill these uh, values of peace, of dialogue, and values of understanding in our children. And coming from some, and, and I'm somebody who actually studied educational sciences, and I definitely, um, you know, I definitely st st stay strong with you with in, in what you just said. So thank you very much for emphasizing this. So I do hope that what, everything which you do in Finland, you can actually spread internationally and can actually share with us work in also very challenging. Um, a very challenging uh, places like Bosnia Herzegovina, where, for example, I live. Thank you again, and I'm looking forward to the discussion later on. And Heidi actually mentioned hate speech also in her um, in her speech, and she told how she actually deals with that uh, on the grassroots levels in Finland. But uh, today with us, we also have one panelist who's working very much um, on hate speech and who has like a very, very good expertise in this field. Today with us, we have Joanna Schmanska from uh, Poland, uh, from Article 19. And uh, Joanna joined Article 19 in 2016, and she worked on a number of issues related to freedom of expression across the Euro Asia region, including media freedom, countering hate speech, and digital rights. She's particularly interested in equality and freedom of expression as mutually supporting and reinforcing human rights. Prior to joining Article 19, Joanna worked at Freedom House as an assistant to the General Rapporteur on the Rights of the LGBT People of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Joanna holds an MA in Russian Studies from University of Gdańsk and postgraduate diploma in International Law from Warsaw University. So Joanna, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. And we are very happy to have you. And the Zoom is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, so, uh, as you mentioned, I uh, work for Article 19. We are a global um, freedom of expression um, uh, organization. And I focus on uh, our Europe and Central Asia uh, region. Um, and uh, I think uh, you've heard that quite a lot. Um, there is such uh, such uh, understanding uh, among some uh, uh, groups that there are tensions between, like when we talk about freedom ex of expression and equality and uh, non-discrimination, which also includes uh, uh, tackling uh, hate speech. Uh, but uh, in fact, if we um, even just uh, analyze uh, international human rights standards, uh, we can easily prove that uh, this is uh, not um, correct. Uh, so um, while tensions can ar arise between uh, uh, competing visions of uh, these rights of freedom of expression and, and equality, um, uh, the focus uh, globally has been disproportionately on these potential tensions rather than the far more important positive relationship between them. Uh, and uh, actually, like I said, international law provides a basis for resolving the, these um, uh, tensions. And uh, how, uh, how we see this um, relation, uh, it's that uh, freedom of expression and equality are uh, fundamental rights uh, whose realization is essential for the enjoyment uh, and protection of all human rights. Uh, they are also mutually supporting and uh, reinforcing uh, human rights. Uh, and uh, we are sure that it is only when coordinated and focused action is taken to promote both freedom of expression and equality and non-discrimination uh, that either can effectively be uh, realized. So uh, that's, that's all like I wanted to explain at the beginning about this so-called conflict that uh, in fact, uh, we believe uh, doesn't um, exist. And uh, I would like to share uh, my screen just for a couple of uh, slides because uh, 
um, I need to, um, I was supposed, I am supposed to focus on um, this um, international uh, standard. So, uh, uh, so uh, uh, it is a bit easier to, uh, to, to discuss this uh, with uh, pictures, given that uh, we have so little time and normally this uh, kind of uh, presentation uh, takes uh, one hour at least and I know that I have only like 15 minutes uh, so uh, the problem with uh, hate speech uh, the, pr the, the problem of uh, identifying hate speech um, uh, is the mainly because uh, as you probably know there is no one definition of hate speech. Uh, if you take uh, different uh, international human rights standards, I don't know, some uh, UN uh, documents, Council of Europe documents, or even uh, YouTube uh, standards uh, provisions, uh, you will see different definitions of what uh, hate speech uh, is. And obviously that's uh, already a very big issue at the start of, uh, of the discussion around this because the differences in this definition can be quite uh, uh, crucial. But uh, to make this simple, uh, we like our definition, how our organization uh, sees this is uh, that hate speech is uh, any expression uh, bringing um, an internal opinion or idea to an external audience, uh, which uh, is an expression of hate towards an individual or a group defined by a protected uh, characteristic. Um, and uh, with these protected characteristics, there are also a lot of problems because uh, each country uh, has a different list of protected characteristics in the national legislation. Uh, usually the, the, the ones that um, are um, common in, in most cases, it's like that uh, protected characteristics are um, race, uh, uh, religion, um uh, also um like um, it can be um, ethnic uh, um, ethnic minority um and uh, but other uh, other uh, characteristics are often not even uh, protected by law uh, and some of the vulnerable groups uh, in because of that cannot uh, count on any um, reaction from the state uh, when they are attacked uh, uh, with hate speech um, uh, on the basis of, of, uh, of who they are. So uh, as you can see, we have a lot of uh, issues with, uh, uh, with uh, hate speech, uh, even just when we are talking about the very basic definitions, what it is, and also who uh, are like anti-hate speech laws uh, should uh, uh, protect. Um, and uh, just uh, very briefly, um, just I want to show you how uh, we can interpret um, uh, UN uh, standards, um, uh, how uh, we can uh, make a typology of uh, categorization of, uh, of hate speech uh, based on um, uh, the provisions in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which is a uh, an old document, it, it has over 50 years, but uh, it was signed by, I think, all, almost all countries in, in the world. So that's why we, we, we refer to, uh, to this, um, because this is a very, like, it has a very broad uh, scope. And, um, uh, and yes, and it's, uh, it's international, it's not regional when we talk about Council of Europe, for example, which covers only uh, Europe. Uh, this uh, this um, document covers the entire world. So um, based on this, uh, we can uh, see three uh, types of uh, hate speech. And uh, the most severe one uh, at the top is based on the provisions in the Genocide Convention and also Rome Statute. And uh, this is a hate speech that must be restricted by law. It's like there are no doubts about it that uh, this uh, this should be um, uh, prohibited, and it's incitement to genocide and 
uh, other violations of international law, as well as advocacy of discriminatory hatred, constituting incitement to hostility, uh, discrimination or violence. So when we have actually that the word incitement is crucial here, um, I will explain you a bit later uh, why. Then we have, uh, when we look at, uh, and it's also Article 20 uh, of uh, ICCPR, uh, which talks about this uh, um, incitement uh, to hostility, discrimination or violence. And then based on uh, Article 19 of ICCPR, which is all like Article 19 is name of our organization. This is the article that focuses on, on freedom of expression, but uh, point three uh, actually uh, also uh, gives, uh, the, like, gives us the boundaries. So it, it says that freedom of expression is not limitless. Uh, and uh, it says that, uh, well, it means that hate speech uh, may be restricted by um, legislation. Uh, hate speech, which uh, is to uh, may be restricted to protect the rights or reputations of others or for the protection of national security or public order, public health or morals, which actually, as you can see, it's quite problematic for, for now already when 50 years later, because we know how uh, states are very uh, willing to uh, actually to violate our rights uh, on the basis of national security or public morals, uh, which is often misused, but this, uh, this middle, uh, category also relates to uh, hate speech towards individuals, and this is very important. So when we don't have an incitement to violence, I know that this is a lot of information for a short period of time. I will show you one more picture in a moment, which will, I think, explain it better. And then we have so-called, not everyone likes this, this name, that, that it's lawful hate speech that must be protected from uh, restriction based on Article 19 of ICCPR. But it doesn't mean that this that hate, any hate speech is good or, or that anyone says that, uh, you know, it, 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 well, some, some of the uh, some of hate speech uh, could be uh, just we don't have to do anything about it. It's, it's the contrary. It, uh, it also says that such hate speech raises uh, concerns in terms of intolerance and needs to be addressed, but uh, in different ways than um, uh, prohibitions and restrictions. Because uh, what uh, we also believe is that we can tackle hate speech with more speech. Uh, it is quite uh, common that, uh, like, um, obviously, there are a lot of initiatives about around uh, content moderation, and this is also obviously very important. There are a lot of horrible, hateful uh, comments uh, on the internet. Uh, but uh, I think it's also clear that uh, by just, uh, just doing just that, like moderating such content, we don't get to the root of discrimination so we don't at the same time we as civil society and and also the states should work uh, on the roots of uh, discrimination in the society it should address these roots because uh, just removing uh, this from our side won't change that there is there might be a huge group of people in the society that feels, this hatred towards particular groups, and um, it is still growing. And if if it's not addressed otherwise, which I will also show at the at the end, then um, it doesn't um, solve the uh, the problem. Uh, so um, this also here is is to just show uh, this middle. Uh, I just wanted to to show. Um, uh, what I mentioned about the, the middle category, that uh, these are expressions um, individually targeting uh, a person or uh, or a couple of people. So these types of hate speech include threats of violence, harassment, and assault, and can lead to a hate crime. Uh, quite 
often it's it's uh, it starts with hate speech uh, and then it moves to a, a hate crime unfortunately uh, and to see the difference between these categories i have this very nice um, graphics uh, here we see what it means the incitement to violence so here is this uh, most uh, severe hate speech that needs to be uh, prohibited um, and restricted. So this is when we have a hate speaker, which is propagating this hatred uh, based on protected characteristics and also has the knowledge of the likelihood um, of the audience being incited to an act of discrimination, hostility or violence. So he knows exactly or she what they are doing. And we have this public audience, which is uh, which is a target of uh, of this expression. And then there is this um, likely and imminent danger of acts of discrimination, hostility, or violence uh, towards the target group. So this is when we have incitement involved, and this is this highest, most severe category of hate speech. And the middle one, which was so um, complicated. Uh, looks like this. So there is no incitement, there is no pub, no no uh, no audience, uh, but uh, we have this hate speaker uh, and a targeted individual, and we have threats that uh, offense that can lead to uh, assault, uh, abuse, and uh, obviously uh, hate crime. Uh, so um, this is like uh, very quickly what uh, what I wanted to say uh, about this categorization. Perhaps uh, later there will be some uh, questions, but I also wanted to quickly mention um, the mechanism that uh, was um, developed uh, almost 10 years ago already uh, to help uh, to the states, but also mainly to the courts, to judges that deal with uh, hate speech cases, how to assess the severity of, uh, of the expression. And this uh, is, is called the Rabat Plan of Action. It was developed by international experts with the su support of the UN Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights. And it provides practical legal and policy guidance to states on uh, uh, implementing Article 20.2 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which requires states to prohibit certain severe forms of hate speech. Um, and uh, in this uh, Rabot, uh, play, the Rabat Plan of Action's emphasis um, is on supporting open and robust debate, uh, including by elevating the voices of minority and marginalized groups targeted by hate. Uh, but uh, also um, this um, mm, Rabat Plan of, of Action has uh, the so-called six part test, which are uh, the criteria to determine where expression creates such a danger of harm to justify prohibitions of expression. And you can see this, um, this six uh, points uh, here. So uh, what needs to be taken into account is the social and political context, uh, then the speaker, uh, so his or her status and influence over their audience, then the intent of the speaker, uh, the content and form of the expression, uh, the content, uh, the extent of the expression and the likelihood and imminence of violence, discrimination or hostility occurring as a direct consequence of them. Uh, expression. And um, also uh, in that Rabat Plan of Action, which I uh, like, uh, it, it, it's, it's easy to find on the internet, it also identifies um, certain issues, mainly on uh, one hand, there is impunity for real instances of actual incitement to violence, hostility or discrimination without redress or remedy for the minorities and marginalized groups who are targeted. And on the other hand, overbroad incitement laws are applied abusively to silence or intimidate government critics and dissenters, in particular against persons with uh, minority religions or beliefs, uh, including religious minorities, converts, atheists, and uh, agnostics. 
so uh, this is, um, I think, very useful also for um, if someone is interested in exploring more uh, the um, international um, standards on, on uh, uh, how to tackle hate speech, uh, the Rabat plan of action and this six part test is, uh, is a must to, uh, to, to have a look at. Um, and uh, also if, if it's possible, I can share these slides uh, later uh, because they can be used freely. Uh, we don't have a problem with that. Uh, also for uh, if you would like to uh, show them uh, somewhere. And um, just not to be so pessimistic about the whole thing, because I started that we have no definition, we, we have no all protected characteristics, in fact, being protected by law, we have either it's very common that the states don't address the real instances of uh, incitement to violence, or on the other hand, what I said, that they have overly broad and strict um, incitement uh, provisions that they use against dissent. It's a big problem in many countries. But there is also a proposal uh, from the Rabat Plan of Action, but also from our organization and other organizations work, working on freedom of expression and uh, hate speech, uh, so-called positive policy measures by states um, uh, mainly, because uh, it's always the state that should be uh, addressing hate speech. Obviously, we know that in many countries it's impossible because it's the state that incites violence. And then we have a problem because even with all the work of brilliant civil society and activists that try to uh, try to develop these uh, positive uh, measures and raise awareness and uh, they make campaigns, etc. Obviously, if you have the state against you, then it's much more difficult to to uh, to target the root of uh, uh, hate speech and of all this uh, discrimination in the society. That's why it is so important uh, to recognize and speak out against intolerance. Like I said, tackling hate speech with more speech by public officials, including politicians, uh, but also can be celebrities, uh, opinion makers who have a key role to play in recognizing and promptly speaking out against intolerance and discrimination. Then a very important thing, which is uh, pluralism and equality in the media, because often we don't have enough of uh, marginal, marginalized groups uh, visible in the media. So that's why it's also important to work with the journalists. So the state should provide that we have uh, pluralism in the media. Um, and uh, independent media should uh, work with uh, civil society on uh, how to cover uh, issues um, related to uh, vulnerable groups uh, and to, uh, to give the chance to, to, to uh, speak out to uh, these um, discriminated um, groups. This is very, very uh, important. Uh, then also public education and information campaigns. Uh, so uh, they can uh, deal with the popular uh, stereotypes, myths and misconceptions. Uh, and uh, equip individuals with greater confidence to identify and challenge manifestations of intolerance in their day-to-day -day interactions. Then equality training, uh, which is uh, for uh, like police, law enforcement agencies, uh, courts, judges, etc., but also teachers and uh, any public officials that we uh, we meet in our lives, and also uh, transformative justice. So it's in the aftermath of large-scale human rights violations, mechanisms for guaranteeing truth, justice, reconciliation, and reparations have proven to be a positive extrajudicial means for establishing an authoritative and shared interpretation of the truth behind historical events, providing a basis for reconciliation in fractured societies. So that would be it from me for now, because I've taken too much space, but this is impossible to talk about this very basic uh, issues um, in such a short time. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna. I think you definitely provided us very uh, uh, useful uh, insights into hate speech and how we can actually deal with it. It's always a very, very complex issue and complex question uh, with dealing with hate speech. And when I'm doing trainings, I always 
ask, get questions from my participants, like whatever we do, it's always so, so less because it's so small number of us who are working on it. Um, but thank you for this robot plan of action. I think this is something very useful that, that people can use if they want to actually recognize which hate speech is very severe and which hate speech really needs to be treated. Thank you very much for your inputs. And now I have the pleasure to introduce to you uh, another speaker on our webinar, uh, Ms. Ana Maria Dau. Uh, Ms. Ana Maria Dau, uh, she comes from Lebanon and she works for Adyan Foundation. Uh, Ana Maria is a Shevening scholar. She completed her MA in conflict resolution in divided societies at King's College in London. And her uh, she wrote her thesis, uh, Know Thy Neighbor, Interfaith Dialogue, Peace Building and Reconciliation in the Lebanese Context, where she actually explored the role of practical interfaith dialogue in the Lebanese peace building and reconciliation process. And this um, thesis actually re received very good academic praise. Anna Maria also um, holds BA in communication arts, journalism, electronic media, but also BA in translation and modern languages. She is actually head of research and courses unit at Adian Foundation, and her scope of work focuses on organization projects on pluralism, dialogue, inclusion, education, faith-based activism in the MENA region and beyond. And she also co-authored book chapters, journal art articles, and reports on topics of interreligious dialogue, peace building, and sustainable development. And also she participated and as a trainer and speaker in several workshops and conferences in Lebanon and abroad. And I'm really looking forward to hearing this uh, uh, also story to, to hear about MENA region and what's happening in Lebanon. So Anna Maria, the Zoom is yours. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, Amina, for having me and Leila. It's a pleasure to speak alongside uh, Heidi and Joanna and John. Um, there is a lot to say. Uh, in this topic. Uh, I don't want to start being negative. However, it's important to understand or to identify what the challenges to for freedom of expression and hate speech are before we can move forward and speak about how, in fact, Adyan Foundation is trying to promote for promote freedom of expression and counteract hate speech in Lebanon and in the MENA region. Um, while brainstorming for this session and based on the experience that I have had in managing projects related to FORB this year, although this is quite a new experience, but it's a learning process day after day, I was able to identify six major challenges that might be um, specific to Lebanon and the MENA region, but I'm sure that they are also um, uh, applicable in uh, other countries as well. The first one is actually quite related to what uh, Joanna's uh, presentation was all about. And it was, it focuses on the lack of awareness or understanding of what constitutes hate speech. And this is something that uh, Joanna really highlighted and she gave um, quite a comprehensive uh, definition on that. But particularly, it is still hard for an individual to understand what constitutes hate speech and what does not constitute hate speech, both on the communal, on the everyday level, and on the legal level. So this is something that is quite uh, new in the region. So we've been, of course, it's been there forever, but speaking about that and trying to counteract hate speech is kind of new in our region. In addition to this misunderstanding or, or lack of knowledge of what constitutes hate speech, we also have another issue related to the fear from the concept of freedom of religion or be and belief and human rights in uh, uh, Lebanon and the, the MENA region, particularly because some people uh, still identify such terms and concepts to the Western world or what is known as the Western world. And in particular, this challenge, I will speak later about how at Adyan Foundation, through our programs, we try to uh, overcome it. So this is the first challenge. The second challenge, which is related uh, to the close relation between religions, religion and politics in uh, countries in the Middle East and North Africa, which is quite, I think, relevant in parts of Europe as well, Bosnia, Croatia, Serbia, and so on. So I think on this level, we share, we share a lot, unfortunately, even if it's negative. Uh, so we speak a lot about identity politics, and it's quite hard to overcome 
uh, hate speech or to tell people you shouldn't speak like that about the different other, especially when you have conflict, especially when you have violence. And I give an example uh, of something that happened in Lebanon around a month ago. I don't know if it made international news, but there was a big uh, armed uh, conflict uh, that started between uh, just uh, uh, two few individuals and then it, it grew bigger. Um, and those individuals are from different political parties and from different religions. However, the conflict was not religious in nature, but due to this close relationship between uh, religion and politics, it was both were instrumentalized to fuel conflict. And it was quite hard for people, especially on social media, not to go back to their identitarian selves, not to go back to their identity uh, politics and uh, to speak as calmly, as rationally, and as objectively as possible. So it's quite hard to ask from individuals that are in such a political environment to try as much as possible to avoid hate speech. So this is another challenge. The third challenge is, and I wrote it and I'll explain it more, is our inability to fight hate speech with anything other than hate speech. So whenever, um, we, we make mistakes. We are individuals, we are humans, we make mistakes. So whenever we see, uh, for instance, I'm a Christian, whenever I see uh, something that is quite offensive to the Christian religion, it's quite hard to count to 10 and say, no, this is, I should really craft a response that is as objective, that is, um, that respects the limits of freedom of expression, that, ex that respects other people's opinion as well to give their opinion regarding my religion. But this is something that people should be trained on. This is something that we should raise awareness on. We cannot expect all people to be as calm and as rational as possible. The fourth uh, challenge, and it's related to the third, is our ability to develop communication skills and to focus on what is known as existential narrative. And this is something I will show an example of at the end of my intervention. When I speak about existential narrative is when I highlight the stories of people that are trying to uh, use alternative communication in order to promote diversity, in order to promote freedom of religion or belief, and in order to uh, promote the stories of heroes that are working positively in diverse environments, um, which is quite the opposite of what we see as the extremist narrative. This is the existential narrative. How to put these values that we share, whether they are private religious values or public values as well into effect. The fifth challenge is the abundance of stereotypes. And I think this is not something particular to the MENA region, but is uh, quite uh, relevant uh, all over the world. And here I would like to specifically focus on gender stereotypes and religious minority stereotypes. And due to these stereotypes and due to this lack of knowledge about groups um, around us, this uh, creates what is known as fear from the unknown, fear from the other. So I fear the different other. I use this hate speech in order to protect myself against this different other because I had no chance. I had no uh, ability to know what this different other or who this different other is. What does this different other believe in? So we do not have this, this luxury, uh, especially in the Middle East or especially in Lebanon, to get to know the different other without us taking the extra mile. For instance, I was born and raised in a Christian area. I went to a Christian Catholic school. I went to a, a Catholic university. So th there are a lot of mi mixed regions in Lebanon. However, there are a lot of uh, regions that after the civil war, you would see that they have a majority of Muslims, a majority of Christians. So it's quite hard for individuals who are raised in those areas um, to freely get access to knowledge about the other. So this is why there is always this need, especially in education, especially in school, to have uh, this education on diversity, this education on living together. The sixth and final challenge is always, in my opinion, the, the socioeconomic factor. And this is quite relevant in Lebanon nowadays and in other countries like uh, Iraq, Syria, Yemen. So the socioeconomic factor is there. Uh, there is a high level of poverty. There is a high level of illiteracy. Uh, countries are facing um, lots of inflation, lots of economic problems, lo lots of social problems. So we cannot expect people who are trying to 
uh, fend for themselves on a daily basis, uh, who are really trying to find any other um, organization that might help them because the government is not doing their job, uh, to put that aside and just focus on uh, people who, in their opinion, are taking away their resources, are um, kind of viewed by them as the enemy or as competitors. So this, we always kind of, whenever we speak about hate speech and freedom of expression, we do uh, forget the socioeconomic factor. And this is something that we re realized during the past two years at ADIAN. And this is why, despite the fact that it's not a humanitarian organization, we did start a humanitarian project because we cannot tell people to live together. We cannot tell people to respect diversity if people do not have uh, the ability to to uh, cover their basic necessity of shelter, food, water, and health. So those challenges might impede uh, the proper promotion of freedom of religion or belief and freedom of expression. However, I said that I will start with the challenges in order to see how we can move forward. And this is what we're trying to do at Adyan Foundation through different programs, and I will focus on um, three major ones. Uh, I'm sure that uh, a lot are aware of the um, FORB TOT course that both Amina and Leila are part of, or just Amina. And uh, this course is presented by the FORB eLearning platform uh, and has been translated, has been uh, readapted by Adyan Foundation. Uh, in, uh, in the Arabic language in order to present it to activists all over the MENA region. Through this adaptation of uh, the course on freedom of religion and belief, this is where Adyan tried as much as possible to bring the concept of freedom of religion and belief as close as possible to the local context in the MENA region by highlighting that, that this is not necessarily just a Western concept. This is a concept that is actually uh, respected, that is actually highlighted in uh, uh, Abrahamic uh, faiths, so Islam, Christianity, Judaism, which are kind of uh, uh, the main religions in the area, and as well as other uh, religious minorities. So by highlighting or by bringing this narrative closer to a language that uh, people would understand or people that would, uh, or that people would find it more flexible. Uh, so this is the 40 OT course that Adyan presents. In addition to the 40 OT course, we already had two and we have one ongoing now. Oh, no electricity. <laughs> See, socioeconomic challenges. Uh, so I'll, yeah. <laughs> we'll we can still that. hear you. We can still hear you. Please keep going. Uh, so in addition to the other uh, two um, courses that we already have, we have an ongoing uh, one now. And those people who graduate from our FORB TOT uh, form what is known as the network uh, for uh, FORB activists in the MENA region. And this network is provided by skill building and training from us in order for them to go and implement webinars, write articles, give lectures, implement initiatives in their local communities in a way that responds to the needs of what every country of what every uh, region needs. Because what works in Lebanon might not work in Iraq, what works in Iraq might not work in Egypt, for instance. Uh, e even though we speak about the MENA region, but the MENA region is quite diverse uh, in itself. Uh, what we also did last year, and this is something one of, one of a kind, is that we worked on a research publication which is related on how to address hate speech when covering religious news. And this is something quite particular uh, in our region because whenever, as I said, uh, there are a lot of times where individual con conflicts that have nothing to do with religious issues, no religious backgrounds, are kind of instrumentalized in order to um, uh, ensure that these identitarian politics are still there in the head of the Lebanese or in the head of other Arab citizens in general. So uh, this booklet was quite uh, different uh, because it did not only speak about the challenges, but it, has, but it has a huge part that is related to recommendations and actual practical uh, steps to take forward in order to uh, fight hate speech that is used in uh, religious coverage of news. So this is basically it. Uh, we 
we are aware of the challenges. We try as much as possible through our programs uh, to, to address these challenges. Um, I'm sure that there is a lot more. Uh, and I'm sure that our work alone is not enough. And this is why there are a lot of other organizations in the area that are still working on that. So in conclusion, I would like to focus on the importance of having two uh, levels of protection. Um, I, I was reading something before this uh, before this session, and I was kind of understanding if people do believe in the limit of freedom of expression or not. And I know that there are two kind of two major schools. One that says freedom of expression is absolute; it has no limits, and it should be protected as is. And another school that says that freedom of expression has limits; um, it is absolute, but as long as it does not uh, cause any conflict, any I think we might lost Anna Maria probably due to electricity or internet cut. We saw that unfortunately the electricity at some point went off. Uh, but um, we will actually continue with our uh, webinar and when Anna Maria joined us later, maybe she can also do the wrap up. Anna Maria, thank you for, so far for your <laughs> for your inputs because I really enjoyed and most of the time when she spoke, I had a feeling she's speaking about my country, Bosnia and Herzegovina when it comes to, to all of these challenges and, and all of these work on, on hate speech, freedom of religion or belief or uh, anything else. But I see that Anna Maria came back. So Anna Maria, please yes. just go on, please. <laughs> Yes. It was just the last idea. I was saying that it's it's quite hard to be either black or white in this stuff, and there are always gray areas in between. But for me, I would consider it as a success when individuals, when citizens, or or those living in a certain countries, uh, reach a level of awareness, uh, reach a level of morality where they have their own laws of respecting the diverse others, regardless of whether we have uh, laws to protect religious minorities or to protect against racism and other hateful speech or hateful comments. So for me, it might be kind of necessary to have certain laws to kind of regulate everything. But at the time, it is quite important to raise awareness among individuals to tell them that it is each and every person's responsibility uh, to respect the different other, to understand, to, to seek to understand the different other, and to understand that even though we are different, it is possible for us to learn from each other and to live together peacefully. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. And I'm glad that you made uh, your comeback here because we saw that, unfortunately, sometimes electricity went off, goes off or sometimes internet goes off. And I know that in Lebanon, you face a lot of issues with electricity uh, because we work a lot together. Anna is my colleague in Inter Inter International Youth Committee of, of Religions for Peace. So uh, we know each other from before. But thank you very much for your input. And I was just saying that when you spoke, I had a feeling you are speaking about my country, Bosnia and Herzegovina, because I, I, we definitely faced very, very similar issues when it comes to, to these things, because we are also a post-conflict area, and we have a lot of this identity politics, unfortunately, which always puts people into their own groups when it comes to certain things, you know, you just think that something you have done, something has changed, and then, you know, just um, politician come in and just, you know, it makes makes things uh, very very serious. Unfortunately, Bosnia and Herzegovina at the moment is going through a serious crisis when it comes to politics and identity. But I hope that we won't go into another war. Uh, things will be better, hopefully. Thank you again for your uh, for your input for your um, for this amazing uh, story about Mina and about Adian Foundation and the work that you do and congratulations on working in these kinds of conditions and working on these topics with people. This is definitely not easy work to do. Uh, so from MENA, from MENA region, we are actually uh, coming back to Europe again. And I have the opportunity, I have actually the, the honor to, to present to you uh, Mr. John Rasmussen, uh, or Jon Rasmussen uh, from Denmark. Uh, and uh, Jon is uh, among many things, inclusion advocate, uh, artist. 
He works for youth empowerment, gender equality, peace and reconciliation. Believe, he believes that building bridges between people, cultures, identities, and faiths is important in order to create and promote the peaceful community, society, and world at large. He holds bachelor in social education. He's an advisor to the Afghanistan Youth Empowerment and Peace Building Organization, amazing organization from Afghanistan, I have to say, and I had the opportunity to meet them. Uh, and he serves as a diversity and inclusion consultant and dialogue for peace trainer and facilitator, as well as a listening ear for the world organization of the scout movement. He's also a PPA 21 graduate from the Elfrats Institute, uh, a member of the UK based New World Leadership Cohort and a volunteer for the Blue Cross aiding homeless migrants. Uh, John actually joined Network for Dialogue in 2021. And John, John, thank you very much for being with us, for taking your time. And uh, we are very happy to have you with us. So the Zoom is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, it's difficult to come last time when there's been such a huge variety of fantastic presentations. Where, where do I fit in there? So I, I can try at least to to highlight a few things. So yes, my name is John, and I'm extremely delighted that I've been given the chance to speak with you today. Um, came to me during this that if we truly want to have freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and somehow combat hate speech, what we need to do is knowing that the other people around you really want to listen. So I am a firm believer that education it's the major way to bring this reconcile. Um, I'll bring this as a personal reflection as, as of my work within the World Scouting and uh, not so much as an official stating, a statement for World Scouting. Um, so in my field of working with the World Scout organization, um, we work on dialogue, of course. Uh, we try our very best uh, to equip these some 57 million scouts that are worldwide with tools that enables them to always engage with an open mind with every individual they meet and so to keep the scout principles. Uh, world Scouting is, in fact, the world's largest educational movement with a strong focus on non-formal education. So it's all about games and doing things in real life that amplifies what you learn in theory. Um, the scout movement is based on, I will give you just a brief, these following principles in which I see actually a lot of commonalities with those that Haiti talked about with the Finnish curriculum, um, because they are divided into three, it's duty to God, which is changed a bit because some people don't believe in a God, so it's mainly a person's relationship with their spiritual values of life, fundamental beliefs and a force above mankind. There's a duty to others, which is a person's relationship with and responsibility within society. In the broader sense of the term, his or her family, local community, the country and the world at large, as well as, well, respect of the others respect for others and the natural world. And there's a duty to self, a person's for less responsibility to develop his or her own potential to the best of that person's abilities, which is a lot of words. But it's all about strengthening young people, adults who are engaged in scouting into being the best possible person they can be for themselves and for every other human being in the world. In the Dialogue for Peace program, that which is one of the major programs we have, which is a partnership program between World Scouting and Kai Seed, uh, we focus on very important things that combined and in action makes us biological persons. We look at, we look at perceptions, we look at identity, stereotypes, uh, fear of the others, conflict and conflict resolutions, and so on. And there is what I also believe is one of the most important elements in this uh, compassionate listening. Because yes, we have a freedom of speech, but that also means that we have very huge responsibility to listen. Otherwise, we'll everybody just speak 
and nobody would really understand what's happening. And then you would have the escalation and things turn into hate. It's easily seen. You can see that every day happening online on Facebook feeds or news feeds in, on the television and so on. It happens constantly. As soon as one person, as soon as there's no more listening, the voices just raise and the word, words get more violent, ending in conflicts in real life harm. Um, and of course, we have two ears, one mouth, listen twice as much as you speak. I should learn that more too. I'm always improving my abilities in that sense too. Um, firstly, I want people to listen compassionately to, to themselves. Who are they? What do they see as the most important things about themselves? And so on. And then we move slowly together into a more safe space, diving into how we perceive the world around us and the people in it. Uh, through the filters that we all have from our upbringing, and those things have been put into our mind to navigate us, but it's only you who sees the world like that. Every individual, individual sees the world through a different set of lenses, and we have to be aware of that. And that's where compassion listening kicks in. We stop, we suspend our judgment, impose our unconscious biases to give room for us to see, hear, and learn, and feel what is the true story. That story that for us is untold. Who is this individual that in this second stands before us? This makes you discover values, emotions, facts, revealing a life that is just as real, just as meaningful, and full of choices that makes this life as important and right as your own. You will learn that if you claim that your faith is the single true one, you also need to recognize and accept that the other person's faith is exactly as true for that person as yours is for yourself. That can give you a boost to move into learning about I'm going to go away from that. That was a weird thought. Uh, because from there, you can move away from the stereotypes, populistic ways of categorizing us all, and into sharing what your beliefs brings to you on a personal level, expanding your own knowledge, breaking the barriers that you thought were there. Those barriers that only come, and when all comes to all, only exist as long as we let them. By learning about the other, through compassionate listening. We also bring in the element of emphasizing, meaning that we try to see the world through the eyes of the other person. We move closer, which as you bond, you find commonalities more often than opposite. You build trust, you grow equality, you grow equal respect. And because of this, you change the way you communicate. You'll find that every encounter but with every encounter, the way you suspend the unconscious judgment and listen to learn more and more, it becomes a default setting for your own way of being. What you are doing is first accepting that you only know very little. Then you listen to learn. That builds respect between people. If you like the word respect, that is, but respect is also needed. It moves people away from hate speech and into a place of curious questioning for the sake of learning. My work in that sense is always focused on, on this to foster an open free dialogue, freedom of speech with responsibilities, freedom of religion, faith or none, always with respect for the other and through knowledge, the real, true, told, by the other, um, an opportunity to put hate in the trash can and enter in dialogue for the sake of learning and expanding our knowledge of the world and the wonders that it holds. So it all starts with me as an individual. And that is, that is how we work with the scouts. We need to uh, say that 
it's not everybody else's we can't push anybody everybody else to change but we can change ourselves and if we can create enough force around changing the way we are the way we interact the way i um the way my words can either boost or or abs absolutely shatter another person's identities because either I listen and understand and learn about this person or I don't care at all. It's a clear choice. But it, education is the number one thing for me. And I could say to anyone that if anybody thinks that they can use or want to partner up with scouts because of this program, it's it, the Dialogue Peace program is meant to be a partnership so that non-scouts and scouts can do trainings together and develop things that can positively change their life. Because in the end, it is all about creating a positive thing that you want to contribute with in your local community or in your country or in your institution uh, before you can even call yourself a dialogue ambassador. So you need to learn skills, understand who you are, First, you understand who yourself are and why you act the way you do. And then you can go out and encounter the world with a mind of, you know, you're, you're, you're being a conscious and cautious person because you know that what you do matters a lot to someone you don't know. Yeah. I think that was something around what I had in my mind at this moment. So yeah, I will, I'll kept it brief, I hope. Thank you very much, John. Uh, John, you, you kept it very brief and you mentioned two really important things that I have to, um, to emphasize. That is compassionate listening, definitely something that we often forget, but also, you know, compassionate speaking, uh, because I always say it's not just like, you know, hate speech, it's also about my freedom of speech. Do I want to use it sometimes if I know that I'm going to hurt somebody with my freedom of speech? That is also, I think, a thing that we don't uh, speak about enough and we don't teach our children. Yes, you have the right to say certain things, but it's also a question, like, do you want to really say them if you know that you're going to hurt somebody? And this is something that um, I encountered in Europe, you know, with uh, freedom of religion or belief and freedom of expression when it comes to for example, the drawings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, which, which was happening in certain parts of Europe. And of course, that is freedom of expression. Nobody can tell you not to do that. It's not uh, hate speech, but it's always a question. Do you really want to do that? Because you know that you're going to hurt a certain group of people. But uh, that's another point. And uh, another point that you said, it's freedom of religion or belief doesn't mean only freedom of religion. It also means freedom from religion. You know, when we speak about this, right, it also means that you are allowed not to have religion. And this kind of, of, a, of a, a right is also, you know, for, for the people who are not religious. And sometimes I think people forget that they only think it's only for the people who are religious and it's only for them to have the religion, but it's also freedom from religion. But um, thank you very much for all of your inputs. Uh, I think we learned so much from uh, about, you know, what's being done in grassroots in Finland, what's being done on, on the international level when it comes to hate speech and freedom of, of, of expression. We learned so much about the MENA region. I think most of our viewers didn't know many of these things. And I certainly didn't know about this um, armed conflict that you mentioned, Anna Maria, that happened like a few months ago in MENA region. And this is a good... Uh, let's say good opportunity for us to actually learn what's happening in other parts of the world, to be more open, not just, you know, uh, look in the societies that we live in. And then from John, we could learn so much about the scouts and about the, about the program that scouts are actually, you know, conducting and how, how you actually teach children to talk to each other. And I think this is something where we probably miss mostly in our education system. We have 11 minutes more and I would have like a lot of questions for you, but I will try with, with one very, uh, a question that, that that's of interest to me, but I think it's also of interest to, to our audience. And I would ask you like, do you think that the laws that we have are enough to protect our freedom of religion or belief also to protect us from hate speech? 
or we also have to do something else? And what would be your tips and tricks from your own you know, work, from your own practice that you could share with our audience on how to actually work on protecting freedom of religion or belief, protecting freedom of expression, but also protecting us and not just us, but other people from, from hate speech. So are the laws enough? Should we just rely on the law or is there something else that we have to do and that we should do? So I would start from the from our first speaker, Heidi, to share with us. Uh, so Heidi, the, the Zoom is yours and uh, I will just now put us all together in, the, in this uh, gallery view and we can actually see each other while we are speaking. So Heidi, the floor is yours. Yes, we need more than, than laws. And I already mentioned earlier the education. It is very important that we have certain points in our curriculum, because if we don't have such education mentioned in our curriculum, how teachers are allowed to, to do it, because education is knowledge, skills, and attitude. So I'm very happy that in Finland we have this latest uh, curriculum that uh, dialogue education is mentioned. And it somehow uh, makes it possible that now we can produce uh, material for such things. For example, material for discussing hate speech. And we have a possibility to also train teachers because they need to do that because curriculum asks that. So it's very important to do the advocacy work for such matter. And um, what I would like to also mention about the, the education that um, it really demands time and commitment. And I'm so sorry to see that teachers don't have extra time to do such education. So we need time and commitment and patience. This is a process. Thank you very much. Joanna, please. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I think I covered it a bit during my presentation that uh, obviously laws are not enough and uh, the problem with the theory that I presented is that it's, it's perfect in theory but it's very difficult to put it in practice. And of course, I am very much aware of that. And uh, like I said, the biggest issue is that we have either overly restrictive laws on incitement to hatred and violence and discrimination uh, that are actually used uh, by the states to silence dissent, or we have real instances of very severe hate speech cases when the state does, doesn't react at all. So even, even if the, the legislation is in place, but with, when, if we are talking about the legislation, uh, even if, okay, the, the, the issues are not, that, uh, not the ones that I mentioned now, all is more or, or less uh, okay. But then there is almost always an issue of uh, the protected groups by these uh, laws, like uh, very often uh, uh, sexual and orientation, gender identity is not uh, on the list. So uh, people from uh, these uh, marginalized groups have uh, no legal protection, not even in hate crimes, not, not, not to mention hate speech. Um, uh, so, uh, so this is a, a, a big issue. And like I said, it is very important to do all the job around uh, getting to the root cause of uh, discrimination. Because uh, obviously, uh, we mostly hear about, like when we hear about hate speech online, is that all about these issues on content moderation. But like I said, this is not, this shouldn't be the only uh, focus uh, and the only response because by hiding this hate you don't get rid of it from the society and uh, there is so much work and so much more difficult work to do uh, because there are no easy answers how to do it uh, just this a couple of examples that I gave uh, it's uh, very important to uh, bring visibility to minority voices so they need to be more visible they need to be heard 
So uh, for a start, it can be just a collaboration with independent journalists to teach them how to, uh, how to cover uh, such issues. Um, and uh, to perhaps to connect them with uh, some of the groups they never ever even had a chance to, to speak with. Um, and this is already something that, uh, uh, that helps because then uh, the readers, they can also confront with the, the, the topic, with the issue, and uh, uh, it can be very, it can be groundbreaking for uh, for many. So, uh, and all the like, what also Heidi mentioned, the, the education, and uh, I think all all what was mentioned today uh, is is very relevant. So, the the answer is no. Legislation is not enough, and it's <laughs> even often not uh, correctly, rightly put. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you. And what about the MENA region? What, we, what can we take from that, Anna, Maria? Thank you, Amina. And I think this is also something that I focused on uh, at the end of my um, uh, intervention. Of course, laws are not enough. And even if they are there, they can be misinterpreted, uh, especially if there is a majority group in power. So laws are easily manipulated, especially if there is uh, politics at play. However, this does not mean that they might not protect sometimes. So in certain contexts, you have to have laws in order to kind of manage in one way or another uh, the whole situation. However, this is for me, it's 10% laws and 90% one education, as Heidi was saying. Uh, however, we have a kind of a positive experience in Lebanon uh, through the Alwan program that is run by Adyan. It is run in over 45 public and private schools in Lebanon. And Alwan's full name is Education on uh, Coexistence on Diversity and Living Together. So this is something that secondary one and secondary two students take as extracurricular activities. Uh, they take a full program on identity, on uh, social contract, on diversity, uh, on inclusive citizenship. So this is something that we are quite proud of because it is something that is kind of uh, encouraging the younger generation to think a bit differently than uh, what we call here in Lebanon as the war generation. And the other thing we should focus on is uh, the work with faith activists, because we have a lot of religious activists, whether religious leaders, uh, individuals working, uh, media professionals working in religious media outlets, and even religious educators. And this is why we have developed something called as religious, uh, known as religious social responsibility, which, which is kind of similar to corporate social responsibility, but it focuses on the fact fact that every faith actor is not only responsible toward his or her own religious groups, but toward society or the local community as a whole. And I think as, as long as we try to incorporate this idea in the minds of young people, in the minds also of religious leaders and in the religious narratives, that the human comes first, that I have to respect the person who is in front of me, then we, in my opinion, we are a step closer uh, towards guaranteeing the proper implementation of freedom of expression and uh, guaranteeing the protection of freedom of religion and belief. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for mentioning this program, because as you said, we work on the root causes. The program actually is something that hey, uh, that Joanna said, like it's also working on the root causes. And Heidi also mentioned that it's not just uh, removing something, putting it aside, but working really from the root causes and and working from the early age. And this is like something that we really like to call like alternative narrative, creating different narrative in the society that already exists. And uh, thank you very much for sharing that. And Congratulations again on this great work. And John, what can we learn from, from Denmark and from the Scouts? Good question, really. Um, I was just thinking that no politics is, of course, not, um, not enough. I was just thinking about how it's sometimes there's a law which is based upon the work of people, of certain governments, and there's a lot of different ideologies involved in that which maybe do not reflect the real society when it all comes to all. Um, it's also some kind of a pillow people fall asleep upon thinking, okay, there's someone else dealing with it. There's a law, there's the police, they will handle it if there's, if there's any conflict and so on. But it takes, it takes, a, it takes something away from the individual. 
um, that that we have a we have a responsibility. And that is where we need to, I agree about the educational part, and I really need to emphasize that in Denmark, at least, the educational system needs upgrading. It needs to work even closer to uh, the non-formal educational system in order to get it a 360 turn and, and include all these kinds of uh, things that will make it more open to having your freedom of speech, your own choice in religion or none, and sort of ending that hate speech. It has to start from a very early age. But if it doesn't, then it's up to the parents, and maybe the parents are not good enough, and then everybody just say, okay, we just rely on that someone else will come and say it. that's not good enough, but we need to learn what is the right thing to do. Not with what, not what the wrong thing is to do. So yeah, we need to change the system. Thank you, Jon. And that's always the hardest thing to change the system. And I think we are all. I think all of us here in the in this Zoom and probably those who are watching us are mostly trying to change the system, which is not an easy thing to do. But we have to try, keep trying. We have to keep speaking, and we have to be very loud in what we want. I always say to my participants when they ask me, like I say, you have to be loud. You have to say what you stand for very firmly, not just what you are against, but what you stand for. I don't want to keep us more busy because we already have one, we are one minute uh, behind. I will just give the floor to my colleague Leila to wrap this up and um, we can go on a deserved break because I think we worked very hard this one hour and a half and probably you've worked even more before. Leila, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Amina. I must say that I've really enjoyed. And now when I watch at the clock, I was like, wow, we are already running out of time because there's so many questions that I would like to ask. And I'm sure that our participants are having much more to share with us. But of course, there's always this limitation. But there is positive side. We can organize some new meetings, webinars. So hopefully maybe meet each other in person and go deeper into all this topic, which will be great. Uh, also, I don't want to waste any more of your time or time of our viewers. I just want to thank each of you for of participating in this webinar and really to congratulate all of you on this amazing work. I'm so inspired by everything that you are doing. And I think that you are really making change in this world, which is great. And I'm so happy now to know all of you, even though I, I know some of you from earlier, but now I'm so happy to have some new people in life that I can be inspired by their work and learn quite a lot from. And I also want to thank you all of our viewers on different social media channels for joining us, for sending some of the comments and their questions and I'm sure that we can reflect some of them later on because we didn't have enough time to to answer to all questions or to address all the comments that were over there so thank you once again thank you for everything that you are doing and uh, yeah I just want to to mention once again that we all need to keep in mind that hate speech is something that is hurting everyone that is leading to the hate crime that is we all need to be aware of it and we all need to fight against it and as John and other mentioned I think that education and listening is the probably first step and a key so I want to invite all of our viewers and everything who is here educate yourself go outside listen to other human beings try really to empathize with them put yourself in their shoes and let's let's build a better future for all of us together so thank you once again and also I want to thank Kaisi, Viera, Europe Youth for Peace for supporting it. And it was great journey. I think, Amina, you will agree for all of us from this training through all these webinars. And we are looking forward to some of the next steps that will come in the next month. And also I want to use this opportunity to wish you all the best for the holiday season that is coming. And I think that deserve break that all of us are looking forward to. So thank you once again for joining us. Thank you.